Um, and really what I'm hoping for out of this is to get input, to, to have, you know, to hear your ideas about where we can, we can go next with this kind of research. Uh, right. because we certainly are a group that approaches things from an angle and a perspective that I haven't approached things yet. So I'm very curious to hear, uh, to hear ideas really. This is the gist of it. All right. So can you guys uh, see my screen right now? Yes. Mm -hmm. I put it on um, there. You should be seeing just the title slide. Is that good? Yep. We're good. Great. All right. So would you like me to wait a little more? Are there others sending you emails that, that uh, uh, well, Jim, I think expected to come on, but Brenda has just been assigned a class from 10 to 12 oh, okay. on Tuesday. Yes. So that's a bummer. Oh. It is her inputs really, but looks yeah. like it's going to be all quarter that way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, wow. so, so I'll, uh, I guess I'll get started and, and go slowly. Yeah. Okay. And it's um, being recorded so people can watch oh, it perfect. afterward too. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, all right, so uh, first of all, I am going to play a clip that should give you an idea of why I'm, uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by the sounds these animals uh, uh, make. They are one of the most loquacious cetacean species. They're one of the most loquacious mammals, really. So listen. <laughs> So I wanted to play that particular clip because you can hear not just the chirps and whistles, but also the really clear um, echolocation uh, sounds that they make. So they make a really large variety of sounds. And I've interestingly, I've spent the, the last, I would say nearly two decades of my life trying to understand the hello of this species, basically. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so during my PhD uh, years, I found that belugas use uh, biologically critical contact poles for group cohesion and for mother calf uh, contact, and that uh, calves first uh, make very underdeveloped calls, not just underdeveloped contact calls, but just, you know, uh, underdeveloped all sorts of calls, and then slowly they start picking up on on the calls that the adults uh, make. So they're first a lot less stereotyped and then they, be they begin to be more stereotyped and they progressively resemble um, adult calls. Um, but it was easy to work with contact calls because they are very, very different than the, the typical chirps and whistles of the species. And they're very easy to identify and they, they have a very particular function so it's a good start to begin to work with, you know, the, the communication system of a species when, you, when you're in the dark, there's nothing you understand at first. So uh, beluga contact calls have been identified since then in, in a number of, of beluga populations. So, so far, every population that has been studied has these contact calls. And this is what they sound like. Well, first I'll tell you a little bit about, about them. They're very broadband, so they reach really high frequencies. They, mm. they always have this kind of creaky door sounding pulse train behind. And sometimes they have an overlapping component that's very stereotyped. It's you know a, a whistle of sorts, for example. Mm. Um, and sometimes they don't, they, they lack the, the overlapping component and it's just the pulse train. So little calves, for example, just produce simple uh, contact calls. So I'll play these two, the complex and the simple one for you. So very much like, I would say like a hybrid between a chainsaw and a creaking door, right? <laughs> uh, so you, you I'll probably know that contacles have been described in, in most uh, social birds and mammals really whose vocalizations have been studied, you know, including humans. The next clip that I'm going and, and, and what's neat about contact calls is that we can identify, we can pick them out of the background chatter of the species. You know, if contact calls weren't uh, easy to identify, they wouldn't work as contact calls. 
they need to be able to do this. They need to have evolved to do this. So I grabbed my daughter's hand when she was nine years old and I said, help me illustrate these for people. And I you know, told her to stand on the other side of a playground that was jam packed with people eating sandwiches and running around with their kids. And I lifted my iPhone and I told her to call me. So what's different there? I, I bet every one of you was able to pick up my daughter's contact call and what and what's similar between her calls is that it always it repeats itself it's stereotyped what's different is that the level of urgency changes mommy at the end right so it's a little bit longer a little bit shorter and that doesn't matter whether a contact call is longer or shorter is not what what matters if you um, uh, identify a series of calls that are stereotyped and that you know, are assumed contact calls, the duration might indicate urgency, but it doesn't mean that you need to classify it as a different call. So th this is important. This is something that I always um, I try and, and get across to people. And in the same manner, in the next clip, uh, I'm sure that just with the little bit of background that I gave you on Beluga contact calls, you'll be able to identify which here is the contact call. So hopefully that was clear enough, you know, mm -hmm. a bunch of whistles and cutting through the chatter of the species, the, the contact call. So we know in biology that the amount and, and the type of identity, identity information that, that is contained in a contact call, for example, is, is really linked to social organization and that uh, identity, identity signals can be shared at the level of the group or they may be individually distinctive and, and that socially stable species and killer whales are a really great example, very often converge on shared group specific uh, calls. And in socially fluid species, fission fusion societies and bottlenose dolphins are a, a typical example, contact calls tend to be individually distinctive because it makes sense. It makes sense to have a call that identifies yourself as yourself. If you're gonna come in and out of contact with individuals that, that you want to maintain long-term relationships with. And so belugas fit this later group of species really, really well. They form uh, very long-term relationships in the context of very large herds and very fluid structures. They have little matrilineal groups of grandmothers and mothers and, and calves that join and, and split from other such groups in a very large herd and males form really long-term friendships. And there's things like cooperation and alloparental care. So it was a natural step for us to ask, well, are these contact calls vocal signatures? And when we, when we study vocal signatures, we need to be clear about what this term means. So there's a difference between individual distinctiveness that, that is a byproduct of the, the way your morphology is or of size, you know? So this is called byproduct distinctiveness. So basically that would be voice, your voice characteristic and signals that actually evolve through natural selection to enhance this individual distinctiveness even further. And, and true vocal signatures that uh, that need to do things like reliably um, broadcast identity in a very high background noise environment like the marine environment need to be less subtle than voice cues. So that's the key difference. They are less subtle than voice cues, so they're very evident. Um, and they, they, they evolve through natural selection and they rely on learning. Um, and so this kind of vocal signature They've been identified uh, in, in some dolphin, uh, dolphinid species, you know, bottlenose dolphins is the most clear uh, species, lots of great evidence. And there's a, a little bit of evidence, very preliminary for narwhals, they, they are a close relative of belugas. And there was, uh, up until my study, just one paper for uh, belugas that suggested that four belugas at an aquarium produced four different kinds of contact calls. So it was a paper that 
you know, made us think, oh, maybe we're onto something here. So this is uh, Cunningham Inlet. It's a beluga uh, nursery uh, on the very far no uh, north, north end of, um, of a place called Somerset Island. Um, and it is where the Eastern High Arctic uh, Buffin Bay beluga population, or, or a portion of it, uh, brings their calves every year and they spend about one month, six weeks uh, in this area socializing and, and nursing their calves. And so we um, explored the, the idea that, that uh, contact calls are vocal signatures in this nursery. This was my, my research site um, in 2014 and uh, very, very changing conditions. In 2015, this is what it looked like. The, the ice, of course, retreated in 2014, but it's interesting, same time of the year, very different. Wow. But I wanted to show you this picture because you get a really great idea of what the landscape looks like in this picture and how um, there's a whole bunch of river canals that belugas would go up uh, into and often they would become entrapped inadvertently in these little pools or canals that you see um, up there. And I'll tell you a bit more about it in a second. So uh, you can see my, uh, my research tower, like you can barely see it. You might be able to see it. It's that little platform amidst the beluga uh, herd. So I spent many, many, many hours in that research tower, actually, there's a, a side story where I got stuck in it. I couldn't get out in time and I had to spend about 10 hours there until the, the tide allowed me to get out. Wow. But anyway, um, and I also watched them from shore and I used a, a calibrated a hydrophone and I took behavioral notes, but there's only a certain amount that you can begin to understand when you're recording 600 animals at once. You know, it's, it's like talk about the cocktail party. Um, wow. So we took advantage of the fact that every year uh, we knew that beluas would go up the river canals and get trapped into these little pools. And this is the pool that you're see seeing here surrounded by sandbars is not more than say something like 50 meters by 10 meters across, so very tiny. And it happens every year. So we thought what an amazing opportunity to know who is being recorded to use a drone to fly over the whales, record them, them at the same time, and uh, you know, be able to, to identify the number of individuals and whether there's little calves or not uh, in, in, in the entrapments. So first we compared the proportion of contact calls in these entrapments to the proportion of contact calls that I had when recording the entire herd. And whenever belugas would get entrapped in a, in a group, <clears throat> they would discard all other calls and resort almost exclusively to contact calls. So the, the difference was huge, 10% to 60% for entrapped uh, groups. So this, you know, emphasized the idea that studying these entrapped groups would be great because what do they do? They produce contact calls, which is the call I wanted to study. This is an example. So that was, um, this was synchronized. So I had the hydrophone and I was flying the drone at the same time. So it's more or less uh, synchronized. And just what I want to illustrate with that video is that they really do resort to creaky doors or contact calls when they are in these situations where they need to communicate with the rest of the herd, presumably. So we estimated the number of individuals uh, in each entrapment and those ranged from 1 to 38. And then we separated contact calls into simple and complex. And so the, again, the complex uh, contact calls had stereotyped, very visually salient features on the spectrograms that we labeled potential signatory elements, uh, P PSE. And it, this is only crazy people do this. We, you know, we identified 10,000 calls manually <laughs> you know, no, this is not deep learning or anything like that, totally manually. Um, and 80% of those calls were complex. So they had this little signature element. And then we went entrapment by entrapment and we classified the contact call types. 
And you can see that in entrapment 11, this is just one example, there's 13 types. They're all contact calls. They all sound like chainsaws. They have the same structure. And you can see there's a difference between, say, contact call one and contact call seven, and that there's a lot less variability within a contact call type than across types. So we, we classified these contact call types based on the um, potential signature element on that, you know, distinguishing overlapping component for all the entrapments. And so then we uh, ended up with 87 distinct contact calls and only eight types were found in, in two different entrapments. So mostly uh, uh, we, we didn't find uh, calls across entrapments. So we needed to know if we had pulled this classification out of a hat or if people would ag agree with us. And, and uh, you might know that the, the naive judge test has been widely used in bioacoustics because humans are still really good at pattern recognition. Um, and so we uh, used all 11 entrapments that had more than one contact call type. And first we um, run, when we created PowerPoints, uh, and we run these PowerPoints by five uh, naive judges uh, and five semi-naive judges. So the semi-naive judges had some experience with uh, analyzing animal vocalizations, but no experience with belugas. And the naive judges um, had no experience at all, ever doing anything with animal vocalizations. And there was no real difference in performance. So we selected to add to these five, 50 additional uh, naive judges for the rem remaining uh, 10 entrapments. And the ages varied. So people were, you know, quite naive. This is my daughter at nine running one of the PowerPoint presentations, for example. So the judges received a PowerPoint presentation that allowed them to listen and to look at the spectrograms. And each slide consisted of a central sample of a given contact call type and there were five random samples or exemplars of each contact call type. And sorry if I'm making this a little, you know, boring, but trust me, it's important. Um, and, they, and the task was to match the middle sample to uh, one of the calls around. So one of the, of the types of, on the template. So for example, uh, entrapment 13 had 60 samples. This means 60 different slides on the PowerPoint, for instance, because it had because we had identified tw uh, 12 contact call types in that entrapment, and we selected five random samples per type. So that gave us 60 slides, like the slide that you're looking at now. So I'll play the center uh, the center call uh, again. And then I'll play just some a few other calls. I won't play them all. So I bet, could you all hear that? Not very well. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so I bet you all picked I based, you know, acoustically, it's the most similar to the center call. And it also, you can see the little, you know, wiggly thing and how it matches the wiggly thing on the on the sample. So visually, it is the most similar. I thought I heard it go down though, instead of up at the last. So let's play it again. This is the, this is the center. And this is I. So it sounds the same, but the spectrogram confused me because I hear I hear E, not E. Right. Yeah, but if you, so you have to consider that, um, so I could say Valeria, or I could say Valeria. The inflection is a little different, but I'm saying the same thing. So okay. there's always, there's always going to be a difference, but the difference is going to be a lot less marked than the difference with another type. So like if I play the center one and then I play the ones that do not belong, you'll see that they're much more dif different. So it's a little longer, but then. So 
those three are really different than the center one. And also they have very, very different potential signature elements. They just, they're nothing like it. Uh, if you look at the spectrum and the fact uh, that, that the inflection of the whistle, I'm pointing mm -hmm. and you cannot see my pointing, but my cursor, the inflection of this whistle is the same here and here, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, there was, so as, we, as I said, we gave 55 randomized PowerPoint presentations to 55 judges. And there was a very high inter-observer classification agreement. What uh, the fleece kappa notion essentially does is it compares observed disagreement with the disagreement expected by chance. And, and that ranged from 0 0.9 to 1. And a value of 1 indicates really great agreement. Um, the judges also agreed with our classification in um, 91 to 100% of the cases throughout all entrapments. And no, no contact call showed disagreement for all five types. And for those that did show disagreement, the disagreement was generally on a single case. So we were pretty happy with the results. Still, we validated um, this with uh, running a stepwise discriminant function analysis that didn't do as well as the human judges. We did this uh, for every entrapment. Um, and there was a 75 to 96% uh, agreement with our classification. So here comes the cool part. The number of individuals in an entrapment significantly predicted the number of complex contact call types that we would, would have in that entrapment. And this never exceeded the number of individuals. So for example, in entrapments with only one individual, we had a single contact call uh, type. So all of that work, just to say that the evidence is still preliminary. <laughs> so our results suggest that, that while belugas may have a, a system of signature contact calls, but we don't know whether the, this kind of signature identity is encoded truly individually, or it might, if it might be shared with close, uh, close relatives, for example, or, or close associates. Um, why? Because the strong linear relationship could explain both, both these things. Uh, shared uh, group signatures could also explain the relationship because entrapments with a higher number of animals are actually more likely to include more family units, maybe. So if related animals share one or, or more uh, contact calls, the number of types identified might also increase with entrapment size. So we couldn't disentangle these this two. Um, Given that, that beluga matrilinear, matrilineal units are found in the context of very uh, fission fusion uh, uh, herds, uh, share, having shared contact call types, so contact call types that are mostly individual, but that you share with a few key relatives, <clears throat> might also be important. So we didn't, we didn't know the answer, um, and we wanted to find out. So. This is what we um, attempted to do in the St. Lawrence uh, population, which is isolated. It's declining. I've been going there every year, pretty much since 2014, since 2008, really, on and off. Um, and the beauty in this population is that there is a long-term photo identification study of, of the, these uh, whales. A lot of the whales are photo identified. Um, and so can we test this idea with known uh, whales. And this is very possible. I'll, I'll let you watch this video and hear it. So again, we synchronize drone footage with recordings in the St. Lawrence and we look at how often whales in St. Lawrence use contact calls. And you can hear the constant chainsawing. So they, um, they are call types that are used in the St. Lawrence population. We wanted to make sure of that first before going into this work. And then we partnered with folk, the DFO uh, people and, um, and partners at, at GREM that were deploying DTAGs. 
And uh, we looked at the recordings in 22 uh, D tags. Again, these are attached, they're non intrusive, they're attached with the suction cups. Um, and we uh, analyzed many hours of, of recordings on these D tags. We, we um, identified contact call series uh, based on what we knew of contact calls and based on the fact that they, they were stereotyped and they had a very high signal to no noise ratio. But then we had the problem of trying to separate the contact calls produced by the tagged individual from, I don't know why the, I think the timings are, became automatic and the slides are jumping without me doing anything. So I may have to backtrack. Um, so to do this, we did, we used uh, the angle of arrival methodology, which uh, basically uses the, the speed of sound in water and the hydrophone separation. There's two little hydrophones on each D tag separated by 4.3 centimeters to calculate the time delay between the two signals uh, measured by cross correlation. And then we considered uh, only contact calls with consistent uh, angle of arrivals uh, to have been produced by the individual wearing the tag. Uh, so if the angle of arrival had, you know, a 30 degree offset from the mean angle, which has discarded that call, which meant we had to discard a lot of calls. Um, yeah, I was going to ask what, how many did you have to throw out? Uh, we threw out a lot uh, because the angles were very often um, more than 10 degrees. And, and I want to discuss this with you guys. It's one of the questions for, for the end. You'll see um, the issue is for belugas. That, so this methodology was created for um, Boronos dolphins and other animals that have that don't have flexible ne necks. Um, but belugas move their head a lot. They have flexible necks. So we might be, we might have been too conservative. You know, if a beluga is able to move her neck from side to side to a 90 degree angle, then the angle of arrival that we used may have been too strict because we really discarded a lot of series where we were, oh, this is beautiful. Do we have to discard it? You know, but we didn't want to cheat. Uh, so yeah, we, we need to come up with something different. So far we have four uh, types attributed to four individuals. Um, and what this study is also leading to is uh, uh, an acoustic investigation of the notion that there are three potentially distinct female communities in the St. Lawrence, so in the same estuary, using favoring different areas of the estuary and favoring preferred associates. And um, this is a really exciting research uh, project that my PhD student, uh, Jacqueline Oben, is starting this summer, hopefully COVID permitting. And we're looking at the contact call repertoires of these three presumed uh, female communities. And why? Well, because the, the existence of these three communities is based on things like distribution and, uh, and photo identification data, but it's, it's not confirmed. It's been anecdotal throughout the years. So if we find, we figured three sets of dialects or, or contact call repertoires associated with these three presumed communities, then this would validate the community hypothesis. So it's something that we're working on, taking advantage of the fact that we're looking at contact calls anyway. <clears throat> and um, something that I'm not touching on uh, today, but it's, you know, could be another talk is the fact that how belugas use sound is a really crucial aspect of, of their ecology that we need to understand to, to gain insight uh, into the effects of, of, of underwater noise, which is a, a really omnipresent problem uh, on our oceans. And so a lot of my work for the last decade, I would say, I would, I would say has centered around the issue of impacts of noise on belugas, especially on mothers and, and calves. But this would be another 40 minute talk. And I um, really wanted to use the brains of this group to discuss things that relate to the talk that I just gave. So I'll talk about underwater noise another time. But today I was hoping that we'd have a little bit of time le uh, left to talk about things like you know, is the fact that contact calls are so variable that there's such a diversity of contact calls, an impediment to something like deep learning or, or you know, automa automating the process of finding contact calls. We're going to have 
hundreds of hours of recordings from these three beluga communities? Can we speed up the process? Is it doable? I, I'm not an expert in that. We have done it all old school manually. Um, do we stick to contact calls? You know, if we uh, like, if we don't, are we comparing um, apples and oranges? And uh, then the problem, of course, of the angle of arrival methodology, which was designed for cetaceans that have no flexible necks. What to do about that? Is there any other way that we can think of? That, that would allow us to peg the calls produced by the animal. Um, this, you know, then we wouldn't miss opportunities to identify what each whale is saying. Yeah, that's it.